Yep, so I guess I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. But I have 100 slides, so I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. Thanks, Justin, for the awesome introduction. Uh, and thanks to all the, can we get a round of applause for all the organizers for putting this on? <laughs> so I was actually supposed to be here with Olivier, but he couldn't make it because he had some back issues at the last minute. Um, but I thought it'd be pretty awesome for this community to tweet at him and kind of send him well wishes uh, to have a speedy recovery, and hopefully he'll be up and running pretty soon. He's been an awesome host for me in France since I've been here, so uh, it's been, I love uh, hanging out with people in this community. And of course, it's Friday, we made it, congratulations. Uh, and so the first time I actually came to Rulu two years ago, uh, the only thing I actually did was I did a Friday hug. So continuing on that tradition, uh, and we, uh, I guess uh, I'll, I'll go into the kind of intro of Friday Hug if you're not familiar, but uh, there's this person, Aaron Patterson, also known as Tender Love, in the Ruby community. And he works from home and he gets kind of lonely and stuff. And uh, to kind of promote happiness and, and be social, he takes a picture of himself hugging the camera on Fridays and tweets out, hey guys, we made it. And sometimes he puts his cat, sometimes he wears like, a sailor outfit and other things, and then people will tweet back at him. And uh, he's done this at a few conferences, and I've definitely been doing it for the last few years. So I always think it's like a cool thing to do in the community. So if you all stand up and uh, look like you're hugging the camera, and we'll do a Friday hug. Awesome. Happy Friday, guys. Cool. <laughs> So what do we have next? So I'm Terrence, uh, like Justin was saying. I go by the Twitter handle, Hone02. Uh, feel free to tweet at me if you have questions. Or there's, I guess there's also the panel after this, so you can probably interrogate and ask me really awkward or weird questions there, too. Um, I come from Austin, Texas. I don't own a gun. Uh, but we have the freedom to own or not own guns, so that's pretty good. Uh, we're also the, hey, Sam. Uh, we're also the. Taco capital of the nation, I believe. So if you're in town and I'm also in town, which might be a rare occurrence, uh, I will take you out and we'll have some tacos. Um, they're pretty good. Uh, we also are famous for barbecue. Um, so there's this barbecue joint called Rudy's in Austin. It's really neat. Uh, it's not like the best barbecue in Austin, but it's like pretty solid. But they have these amazing like hand washing machines, and I really love them. Uh, you basically just like stick your hands in, they wash your hands for you after like eating a bunch of greasy meat, and then your hands are all clean. They have these stickers that you can get, and you just like put them on, so that's pretty awesome. I love that part. Um, I'm also a big fan, like Chris was saying earlier, of karaoke, so uh, I've been trying to promote more Ruby karaoke. I've heard there is some karaoke here in Leon, so after the conference, uh, we'll be going out. I think Chris has a place actually picked out uh, that has a private room karaoke, um, and we'll go singing. Um, so this is Charles Nutter from Jay Ruby and Arnie. Uh, this was in Taiwan. This is them singing A Whole New World together. Uh, this was me and Ruby Nation also singing A Whole New World with Kenichi. Uh, so, you know, a lot of good times. And I don't know if PJ's here, but I figured we would have uh, some dedicated Katy Perry for you uh, tonight, so I hope you can come join us. I think it'll be a pretty good time. Um, so if you don't know, I work at Heroku, purple outfit thing. Uh, there's also two other people here, uh, Yannick, who gave a talk yesterday, and Damien, uh, one of the original organizers of Rulu. Uh, so if you want to come ask us questions about Heroku, feel free to come talk to us at any point, uh, though I guess the conference is almost over. Um, we are hiring. Uh, obviously, we are hiring in Europe as well. Um, I think about 30% of us are remote at this point in the company, so we do support that remote working culture. Um, and if you're interested in, in working for us, uh, come talk to us. Uh, I work for, I run the Ruby Task Force, which is the team that kind of runs Ruby things on Heroku. We're all Ruby Task Force members. And uh, one of the coolest things I think about working on this team is that I get to work uh, with Matt's Ruby team. So if you don't know, Heroku hired three full-time Ruby core developers to just work on the Ruby language itself. Uh, 
because we wanted to give back to kind of the language that helped us get to get us to where we are now. Um, so if you don't know, uh, this is Matt here on the right, uh, who's the creator of the language. Um, and then we have Koichi here. Uh, and uh, Chris was talking about some of the Argen GC stuff. Uh, this was the guy who implemented it. Um, so if you see him at a Ruby conference or something, you should probably give him a nice big hug. Uh, he also implemented YARV for Ruby 1.9, which was like around a 30% performance increase across the board from 1.8 uh, for longer running processes. Um, he doesn't really have like a title handle thing. Uh, so me and Richard were trying to come up with something. So we're, we're trying to promote this like performance prints thing. So I should probably just start like calling him the performance prints. Hopefully we'll catch on. Um, and then the last guy is Nobu. A lot of people, th he's much less well known, but he probably deserves some of the most gratitude for the stuff he does. So he works full time on fixing bugs in Ruby itself. So like fixing seg faults and other things. Uh, one of the awesome things about working with him is that oftentimes I'll have a bug or something that either comes in through some support ticket of like, oh, there's this weird edge case in Ruby and one of our customers is running into it. And I'll let him know about it and then he can look at the ticket and oftentimes like I'll go to bed and then when I wake up in the morning because of like time zones and stuff, he'll like have a commit on trunk or like have some gist that says, oh, like this is this problem and like this fixes it. Um, so on the core team, he's known as the patch monster. Um, and there's a reason he's known for this. So if you pull up the log of like the last, uh, in the last two years, like the number of commits uh, people on the core team have done on trunk. Um, Nobu is the number one committer by like a large amount. So he has like 2,700 some commits and next guy has only 800 something. So he spends a lot of time just like fixing bugs. When I was in Oedo, someone was giving a talk and he noticed during the talk like there was a bug in the Ruby thing some guy was presenting on. And by the end of the dude's talk, he like committed something to Trunk that fixed that patch. So I mean, he's like super dedicated to, and he's he's a really awesome guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, uh, if you come out to Ruby Conf, he, uh, all three of them usually come out as well, and it'll be in San Diego this year. I think November 18th to 20th. Um, and uh, I know if you've noticed, there's like six names on this thing or six handles. Uh, so this SVN handle is not actually a human. So these are the top five human committers. If you leave this person out. And I wanted to highlight uh, this last person, Zizak. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you know who he is, but uh, he's, been a, he's been my personal mentor on my path on being on Ruby Core and has helped me out a ton, just like, just a bunch of, spending a bunch of time with me, like getting me on the right foot and helping me contribute back to Ruby itself. And uh, in addition to that, he maintains like RDoc and a lot of the documentation for Ruby. So uh, the fact that we have uh, even adequate or good documentation at all. Like he does a bunch of work on that. Um, he also does a bunch of stuff with, he's on the Rails issues team as of recently, I think like a few weeks ago. Um, and he spends a bunch of time working on that. And he also does um, a bunch of stuff on RubyGems. So if you haven't tried out the new RubyGems release, it came out uh, RubyGems 2.3. Uh, Aaron did a bunch of work on making gem install way faster. Uh, especially for like international stuff, like not like reusing connection pools, like uh, you should try that out. And it was on master for a few months, like the commits. And Zach was one of the main people who spent a bunch of weekends and was like, "Hey, uh, Dr. Brain, who's the maintainer of Ruby Gems, like what is it going to take to like get this release out? Like, how do I fix all the bugs?" And so he was hugely instrumental in getting all that stuff out there. And uh, I don't really know a lot of people who are kind of love this community as much as this guy. So uh, I hope uh, I can help get him a Ruby Hero Award for next year for all the work that he does um, in the community. So on to my uh, actual talk. So I'm going to first talk about, I guess, my personal story of how I got in Ruby Core and uh, the, like, the contributions and stuff I did there and kind of the process you do to get on Core itself. Um, and then next, we're going to talk a little bit about like working with Ruby itself. Uh, so Chris kind of did a good job of like diving into some of the internals, the GC, uh, I guess string theory. Um, but this talk is this part is more about like actually communicating and and working with these complex problems that Pablo was talking about, like working with people, right? Like uh, the the really hard stuff. Um, and then the next part is kind of going to lead a little bit into the panel, but like some thoughts of stuff in the near term of what I'm thinking about for the future. Um, 
and uh, hopefully that will lead into some discussions for lunch and then into the panel as well. So let's start off with a story. Um, so my story on Ruby Core, I didn't really have plans on like being on Ruby Core really at all. It wasn't something I thought about. I'm not like a major C hacker who like spends a bunch of time like digging through the internals like uh, some of the other speakers here who have done way more than I have. Um, but like back in November of last year, there was this really bad vulnerability that came out, um, and it you know came out and we found about it and. Uh, if we go and look at the exploit, we can kind of see, kind of walk through and see how bad it was. Um, so this is kind of the, vul this is how you exploit the uh, vulnerability. It's like you just call .2f on some string or some object and uh, it will uh, cause your Ruby to crash. Uh, so like on the surface, this doesn't seem too bad. So, like, like how often do I call .2f on a bunch of my code in like production, right? Probably not too much, but in standard lib, like if you use the JSON library at all, if you parse it, like if you have any floating point kind of input, like you'll call .2f. Um, I'm sure this is called in YAML and other things too, and it's probably used in a bunch of places that you aren't expecting. So if you're just like repping in your own app code for it, like you might not find it um, as much. So I mean, how many web apps actually use JSON? It's probably a large number of people. Um, and so when I was preparing this talk, I went and like looked up like what the actual um, how to actually like exploit this thing. And uh, there's a thing on Metasploit, and if you just specially construct this like special floating point string, um, which if you look at this code here, it's like actually not that complicated. And then you go and parse it within the same Ruby script, you'll get this. It'll just cause your Ruby interpreter to crash. Um, and you can imagine you can extrapolate this to like a Rails application where it's like, oh, I have some endpoint that takes some JSON input, and if someone sends a specially crafted string that causes my app to call parse on it, then my Rails app will crash. So it's actually a pretty easy bug to exploit and like cause servers to crash. So easy to exploit, well, like what is actually affected by this, right? So uh, in, in the announcement, basically if you had anything that was older than, or newer than 186 patch level 230 in 2013, the end of 2013, uh, you were vulnerable to this bug in your like Rails or whatever web application out in the wild in production. Uh, and uh, to me, that basically meant like almost everyone. I don't know, I actually don't know anyone who's running 186 in production, or there aren't that many people. Um, I mean, I don't know, show of hands, how many people are running 186 still? No one, right? Uh, so like basically every single version of Ruby out there was affected by this bug. And uh, you know, Ruby Lang, came out with this, or on Ruby Lane, there was a post that said how to fix this if you just upgrade your Ruby. So they came out with a patch release for 1.9.3, for 2.0.0, and then 2.1 was coming out that Christmas, but they're having preview releases, so we don't want to have vulnerable preview releases either. So released all that stuff. Um, and then at the bottom, they had this nice little note that was like, please note that Ruby 1.8 series or any early releases are already obsoleted. There will be no like fixed versions for them. So um, I mean, at, and then I was also, we also have like, what about 192, right? Like, uh, there was nothing about that at all in the news post. And I went and had to dig through the archives and talk to people on core. And I eventually found this tweet that said Ruby 192 was dead. And this was posted in Ruby Kai, at Ruby Kaigi, like in sometime in the summer. And there was like no news post about it at all. So uh, we had these options. And it was kind of like a really terrible day to tell your customers, uh, like, we're not going to support Ruby 187 and 192. Like, when this vulnerability came out. So you're kind of left with three options here. You can either do nothing, which is the first one, uh, which would be telling your customers like they need to deal with it themselves. You can backport the patch a single time um, and then kind of provide that and say, please migrate off of this. Or you can go and like try to maintain this stuff for a reasonable amount of time and kind of give people uh, a like good window to kind of move off. So um, not feeling really good about the first two options, we went with number three. And we released uh, on Heroku like new patch levels that included the fix for this and tested it and made sure it worked. And then on GitHub, we provided uh, these Ruby source codes. So you can go and build this. Um, and then we were talking to the, the security and the core team. We're like, it's probably not, like we don't want to maintain this just for our customers. Like if we're gonna do the work for this, like it'd be great to kind of put this in the public and like make it so other people can benefit from the security and the other work that we're doing here. Um, so that's when I actually got starting talking with Zach and 
he told me to kind of send this email. And so this is the email that you send to kind of get on the core team. And basically, you send to Matt's and a bunch of other core people. And then you basically tell them what you want, why you want to join core and like what you're going to do and kind of link to some patches and other things that, uh, you're related, that are related to what you're trying to do. And then uh, if you're lucky, then you get some tweet like this that says, hey, like welcome to the core team. Then you get a bunch of other emails as well. Um, and then after that, um, we released this notice on Ruby Lang that was like, we're extending the maintenance uh, until uh, June of this year. So uh, we'll do all, we, we're not going to do official releases, but we'll actually backport security fixes and vet them and check them and, and do that work. So that was a joint effort between Zach and I. Um, so I'm, fish, I'm the maintainer of 192 and 187. Super awesome rubies. Uh, so there are other ways besides uh, being a security backporter kind of person that's maintaining rubies to be on core. Uh, the, the easiest one is probably if you're actively contributing to Ruby and you're submitting patches all the time, they, like most open source projects, you kind of get tired of like, pat, like committing other people's commits in, so you eventually like give them commit bit. Um, there's only two Windows developers on the core team, so if you're interested in doing like non POSIX work in Ruby, um, I don't know if you've been to like Rails Girls or other things, but oftentimes a lot of these people come in with Windows, and I think GitHub actually released some stats about like how. GitHub for Windows is a huge percentage of the people coming to GitHub um, as well. And so there's a lot of Windows users out there, and not having great support for Windows uh, is definitely hurting the adoption of the language uh, for other people. Um, but you know, it works, and we have two people working on it, but it would be great to have more. Um, and the other, the kind of last option that's, I think, the hardest is if you write a standard library, if you write a library that then gets put into standard lib. Um, and the reason this is hard is because I think as a, a general philosophy in the community as well, like we don't want standard library to kind of grow out of control. So we try to keep it pretty clean, and it's going to be pretty hard to get like a new thing put into it. So there has to be a pretty strong case there. Um, so as a friendly reminder, uh, please upgrade your rubies. Uh, so this is June. So at the end of this month, we will be not supporting 187 or 192 anymore. So the support for that ends this month. Uh, how many of you actually have 192 or 187 apps? So just a few of you. That's actually pretty good. Um, please upgrade. Uh, I mean, secured, like, I don't think you want to be responsible for maintaining security of your own rubies. Like, it, I can tell you from first-hand experience, it's not fun. Uh, but, uh, and then also, like, people on 193, like, 193 support is also ending uh, in 2015. And so that's not too far away. Um, so I would kind of think about kind of upgrading that. And I think the core team has done a good job of releasing rubies that are much less painful to upgrade. So like the 1.8 to 1.9 was pretty rough with inter introducing coding and a bunch of backwards incompatible things. But I think like 1.9 and up like has been much smoother. And we've been very conscious about that. So I would definitely look into this if you're still on 1.9.3. Um, so this kind of... That, that was kind of like my story of getting into Ruby itself. Um, a lot of it was kind of not what I was expecting to do or like really be a part of, but I've been happy being on the team and kind of seeing a lot of that stuff. Um, and so this next part's about like how you can look into contributing to Ruby itself. Um, and uh, to start off with uh, like, why should you care about contributing to Ruby at all, right? Um, and uh, to preface that, I guess I should talk a little bit like why I personally care. Um, so I really like this community a lot. Um, and uh, I've been actively involved in Rails Girls. I know we have one tomorrow, actually, uh, here in Leon. And if you haven't had a chance to partake in one, I would totally recommend like wherever you're from to get involved in your local chapters um, or in a Rails bridge or something where you talk to new people in the programming community, because it definitely gives you like a whole different perspective of like how hard it is and how much our tooling really sucks, uh, and kind of just a new appreciation of all that. Um, but I, I think it's really awesome that our community is like super welcoming with open arms, and like something like a Rails Girls or Rails Bridge is so successful in our community. And I, it's uh, like um, Josh was talking about, just like there's something really special about this Ruby community that is not really replicated. It's hard to describe, but it's not like replicated in other language communities. Uh, when I was at Ruby Nation, uh, my fellow coworker Kenneth, who does like the Python stuff, um, 
came to the thing to see my talk and was talking with some of the attendees. And one of the comments he made to me was like, there's this energy and like enthusiasm in attendees that he doesn't see uh, in his Python conferences. So there's definitely something really special about the community here. And uh, to highlight an example, I was in New York a few weeks ago at Kickstarter, and uh, I was just we were uh, I was just hanging out with a friend, um, and then working on just like some memory tuning stuff with their app, just uh, trying to help them out there, and you know like playing with some stuff uh, based off of some of the work Amana has been doing. Um, and we managed to like cut down their boot time by like eight seconds uh, by just adjusting GC tuning settings. And uh, one of the really awesome things, besides like their app is now like 40% faster on booting up, was that um, they really felt this need to like, we don't just want to like benefit from this, we want to give back to the community. And I feel like there's a strong sense of that in this community as a whole. And like, they were asking me how they could either contribute graphs or like data from their production app back to like Koichi or other people in the core team to kind of make Ruby better for everyone else. And I think that's an awesome thing about like this whole community and why I spend so much time working on community things and, and wanting to see this stuff move forward as a language um, and ecosystem. And so one of the things that I learned um, for the, over the last few years has just been uh, like the technology and the language is great that we're promoting happiness, but uh, a lot of the people that I meet at these conferences and everything become really close friends, like probably the people I spend talking to most every day. And uh, you know the people are definitely the most important part that make the community. Um, and it's really awesome to be able to be here and, and do this kind of work. So why I think you should care. So I think you should care about uh, giving back to Ruby because I think all of you are here because you enjoy programming in Ruby and you want to continue doing that. Uh, like the question, will we be doing it in 20 years? Like, you know, you never know, but if you don't contribute and you don't engage in these conversations, you won't know, you won't be able to voice like the concerns or problems that you have that the core team is not seeing, right? Like if you don't uh, voice your opinions and you're not gonna get everything you want because it is Matt's language at the end of the day, but uh, if you're not engaged in those conversations, the language isn't going to solve the problems that you have anymore. You're just kind of waiting for other people to decide that for you. Um, so given all that, like let's kind of jump in on like how you can get a little more involved. So yes, Ruby is still on Subversion, so if you want to use it, uh, the easiest way is to just check out Subversion and get the trunk. So that's the thing, basically the equivalent of master if you're not familiar with Subversion. I had to relearn Subversion again when I got onto core and it was a somewhat painful experience because it's like really different again. Um, and then you can check out specific branches. So uh, there's like the 200 branch um, and then there's 193 and 197 and all those. And then with 2.1, uh, that branch, like you don't do 211 or 210, you just do uh, Ruby underscore two underscore one to get that, that whole series. Um, if you want to use Git still, you can use Git Subversion, uh, Git SVN, and Charlie Somerville has this gist that's been pasted here. It basically tells you if you clone the GitHub repo and then you do a Git SVN uh, init with the thing from the, tr the SVN remote and then kind of move all this stuff and then do a rebase, you'll get um, Git SVN with that. Uh, I did this kind of the painful way where you normally just do Git SVN clone. It took me three days to copy this down. So this is definitely way faster if you want to go down that path. Um, so some pro tips I learned uh, kind of just interacting with the source code and, and doing these backports. Um, so I didn't really understand what the patch level was. Um, and it was just this number, right, that you get with every Ruby release. And I found out that basically this patch level is incremented by hand in every commit that happens in Ruby. Um, so that was something I learned. That so when you're committing stuff on trunk, you actually commit the stuff by hand and increment it. Um, and then all the dates are in uh, Japanese standard time because I guess it was made in Japan. Um, so I didn't know that when I was originally committing. And so if we go back to this SVN bot from back uh, in the beginning of the slides, uh, there's these 710 commits. And basically this bot will go and like fix these dates for you. So the first commit I made, like, of course I just made in like whatever central time and it was like, yep. And then the bot was like, nope, you're wrong. This is in Japan time. And so it goes and like fix my commit for me and with an additional commit. So these are the commits that that bot makes and it has made clearly a lot of them. Um, so with running the tests, like we, 
it's usually they recommend that you make a separate build directory so you don't, when you're doing the commits and stuff, you don't have like artifacts lying around your source code. Uh, so make a different uh, directory. You need autoconf to get your configure files, then you can configure, and then you have to definitely, you have to specify like all the different dependencies like you do in like RVM or RBEM that automatically do that stuff for you. So you need all those shared things. And then once you do that, you can configure it. And then uh, de also set it to some prefix. So when you're building it, you can um, actually like manually test it and run it. Um, and that's really important for some of the testing stuff. And then by just running make test all, uh, you can run all the tests. And then since this uses mini tests under the hood, it's just Ruby. All the tests in Ruby are written in Ruby itself. Um, you can specify like individual test files to run, so you don't have to run the whole test suite. Um, so if that's green and you have that working, then you have like a working checkout of Ruby itself. Um, and so you can compile your own Ruby there. Um, and so given that, like when you start submitting patches, uh, you want to either use the unified patch stuff using diff, um, but you can also use, they also accept the SVN or git diffs as well, so you can just use those to generate these patch files. And then we'll use those to attach to kind of bug tickets, and that's how you get those patches submitted there. Um, so now that you can, like, if you splunked in some of the GC stuff that Chris was talking about and you create this patch, you're like, hey, I want to change GC. Now you can know how, now you know how to like create that patch. So like, how do we actually communicate these changes in these discussions uh, with the core team? Um, so the first thing is like, most of the discussion happens over email. And so if you go to the homepage on rubylane.org, on the right-hand side, there's this mailing list link. And if you click on it, you'll get to this page. And there's four different mailing lists that you can get on. The Ruby talk is like the Ruby forum, and so that's kind of where you're just like general Ruby users, you ask questions of like how stuff works in Ruby, and you can help respond there. Um, Ruby core is like the main core committer discussion, so, and it also is where all the bug issues get filed. Uh, so if you file an issue on the bug tracker, you get a new email on this mailing list. So if you want to keep up with Ruby core development and kind of the general discussions, like this is definitely the list you want to be on, and every core committer is required to be on that. Ruby doc or like doc changes there. Um, and then Ruby CVS. So clearly like Ruby has been around for a long time. Um, but this is basically every single commit that ever happens on Ruby, you get an email on it. So if you want to follow the commits, and I know Rafael Franca actually reads every single commit that goes into Ruby. So like if you want to do that, like this is definitely the mailing list to sign up for. But if you're interested in, in just general Ruby, like being active in that discussion uh, and you want to follow that stuff, I would Definitely recommend like the Ruby core mailing list, but it is a good amount of email. Um, and so that's like the main thing. And the other kind of point I want to make is Twitter is not a bug tracker. Like if you have complaints or things like 140 characters is not the way to kind of discuss these things. Uh, they're not like really easily archived. And like who knows like if the people who are actually working on this stuff is going to read that one random tweet that you had because like your Ruby seg faulted or like you don't like how this works. So. It's fine to complain on Twitter, but if you actually want to have a discussion and do that stuff, I highly recommend not trying to use that as your tracker for bugs. Um, we use Redmine. It's not the prettiest thing, but it's what we have. And uh, this is kind of the front page there. And the first thing you want to know is if you want to submit like any bugs at all, you need to actually create an account. Um, uh, so like you go here to sign up and create an account there. Um, some other things to note is all the bugs are fixed on trunk first. So I didn't know this at first when I joined, and I wanted to get stuff fixed in other branches. But all these things get fixed on trunk first, and then you can file a separate thing to get that backported in the release that you're actually interested in. And uh, after you create a thing, then an account, and you sign in, then you click on this thing on the bottom of that home page. And this, is kind of the, this will take you to all the issues that are related to Ruby trunk, which is where all the issues are held. Um, and from there, you can view all the issues, so a lot of clicks. And then you kind of get this list. And usually what you want to do is, like, before you found an issue, like, try to search for it to make sure there's not a previous discussion. Like, maybe it's been fixed already, or uh, there is some prior art of, like, why it doesn't work this way. Um, but if you can't find it, then you'll want to go back um, to the home page and click anywhere on the top. There's this new issue link, and click that. And it'll take you to this page. And basically here is, like, the main form that you go and you f file stuff. So under tracker, there's bug. So that's like bugs, obviously. Features are like new features in Ruby, and there's like miscellaneous. Um, so some of the stuff is like proposal or policy changes, stuff that doesn't really fit under like 
code there. Um, and then the other important thing is category. So there's like different categories where to file this under. So core is like the core class libraries, like stuff that's usually written in C that's part of core Ruby. There's stuff for standard library um, as well, as well as like special stuff for specific extensions like OpenSSL or doc changes. So they have a whole list of things that you can assign that stuff to. Um, for Asani, like you might not know who the maintainer is, but that's okay. Um, just leave that empty and then uh, target version is usually like, yeah, if it's a bug on trunk, like basically that's fine. And then kind of list like the Ruby versions that you've you've, you've tested this on that like you've gotten this bug on is definitely really helpful. So you can have that to be able to reproduce. So uh, here's the maintainer list. This is on GitHub. Um, it's in the, if you go under doc under the checkout, there's a maintainers.rdoc that basically lists like all the maintainers and what they maintain. Uh, so like I was talking about before, Zach maintains uh, documentation stuff, um, Matt maintains the core classes, and um, Matt also maintains like I guess the language. Um, so like they, there's this long list of like all the different things that the different maintainers are kind of in charge of. Um, so when I first started like getting into this, I uh, was trying to get like a commit in, or trying to get these policy changes in, and this was like kind of the first draft. I was like, you know, it'd be good to document some of these like release changes, like 192 didn't have release. And I wrote this like draft, basically like I paired with Zach on it. And uh, it was kind of like, it was pretty terrible because it's like this really long prose. And like, you're imagining these people who don't necessarily speak English really well, like reading this thing, it's gonna be hard to like kind of grasp what you're trying to get at. So at the end, like we end up um, pruning it down to like something much more concise and having like bolded lists and stuff to kind of really like get at the points that you're trying to make and not have to worry about like all this other like flowery English that's surrounding it. Um, and that definitely helps a lot there. Uh, and then onto some security stuff, like obviously responsible disclosure is a thing. So if you run to security issues, please email us, security at rubylane.org. I'm on the security team. Um, and if you can provide vulnerability and use cases for for the release branch maintainers, it's definitely really useful to be able to be like, take that repro code and try it against your current branch that you're maintaining, and then decide if like that actually is affected or not. That's really helpful for testing that out. Um, so there was this issue with SSL about like insecure defaults uh, that was filed um, a while ago, and uh, by default, originally Ruby just gets its defaults from OpenSSL. So the default ciphers OpenSSL provides is what Ruby uses. Uh, I, a lot of languages do this. Um, but at the end of the day, it was kind of decided that the defaults aren't necessarily like the best ones, especially of older versions of OpenSSL. Um, so there was this whole discussion about whose responsibility was it. And uh, we ended up deciding that, yeah, like Ruby should kind of be more responsible for just providing a better secure Ruby out of the box for people who don't need to or want to think about any of this stuff. Um, and so there was this kind of large patch that basically whitelisted, like, these are the good, like, SSL uh, ciphers that we're gonna use. Um, but there was a bunch of discussion about it, and I think uh, the patch wasn't super great uh, because it would lead to, like, exceptions being raised. Basically, if your cipher, if you use a cipher that was in there, which is kind of backwards breaking incompatibility. Um, but we wanted to kind of discuss this in a, not just, like, async over the mailing list. Um, so in order to have that, we have these developer meetings. And uh, the way they work is you, if you want to have a developer meeting, you basically draft some type of agenda and other people can contribute to it. And you say like, oh yeah, these are the things I want to talk about. And then you need to find a date that kind of works for people. And then if you need Matt's there, you need to, you should probably ask and make sure he's available to go to it. And then uh, after you get his approval, then you can kind of, it's much easier just to get the other people on Ruby core involved there. Um, so here's like an sample agenda where we talked about uh, so it's just like we go through this during the meeting, um, and then uh, you kind of send an email like this that says, hey, this is gonna happen on this date, like, and uh, that's kind of how that works. Um, and some more stuff that I was just talking about, like, something to note when you're dealing with any communication with the core team is like, English is not the primary language at all, so like, try to be conscious of that fact, like, um, don't use really complicated words, like, keep things simple. Um, that tends to work better. If you can provide code, that's definitely better too. Like, uh, like people on Ruby core write Ruby and deal with code. Like if you can provide a code example, that's definitely like much easier for them to parse and get what you're trying to say than just like some English describing that problem. Um, and then 
like I was saying with mailing lists, like the mailing list is a main form of communication. A lot of this is read over email. So don't try to do like fancy markdown or other things like in this box that might look okay on the website. Uh, but like be cognizant of the fact that people often read this stuff over email and like that's their main form of communication. Um, so kind of blitzing into this third section and into lunch and the panel. So uh, kind of like stuff that I'm interested in having been on this team for a little while now. Um, just like things that I think are important uh, for Ruby to be successful in the future. Uh, some of the goals that I think are super important are trust. So this is like I'm on the security team because I think this is super important. Like being able to trust that your Ruby is secure, that what you're running is reliable and, and you can trust that things are going to come out when there are bug security vulnerabilities and they come out in a timely fashion. Um, transparency, like getting more people involved for, uh, revolves around getting a bunch of people like being able to see what is happening. Like I think right now we have a bad reputation of being this kind of black box. So I definitely want to work on fixing that and making that not an issue. And the last thing is like trying to help people be onboarded onto this and not um, being scared of like getting involved in the mix of uh, being of developing and contributing to Ruby. Um, I mean, this is a language that we all love and develop with. So uh, one of the things with transparency that I've been working on is uh, when we have these developer meetings, like I've been pushing for having English notes and summaries. So a lot of these times, the discussions still happen in Japanese. So that's still like the language barrier is still a real thing to some degree. But uh, they're open to you know like having stuff in English and. Uh, like I'll go through and try to get these things translated and, and work with people on the core team. So you can follow along with, we put this on the wiki, which is on under Redmine. And we have summaries of every meeting, hopefully for the rest of this year, starting with uh, two months ago. And uh, you can go and follow along like what happens with all these things. Um, uh, I'm looking to potentially move us to Git, but I don't, like this is definitely not a thing set in stone. But uh, I mean, all this stuff is using subversion, so it involves like, migrating the tools to make them work with both of those things, um, figuring out like what we need there. Um, there's a few different things, especially like Redmine. Like if Redmine doesn't work, kind of the process is broken. And then at that point, we can have a real discussion with that team. And I've been having ongoing discussions with Matt about this. He's definitely open to it. So it's not a thing that is impossible. Um, uh, figuring out how to do support for legacy Ruby is like some people might not need to be on 187. Um, and provide documentation on how to continue to do that um, in a maintainable way. Um, and then, again, like improving onboarding materials, writing better documentation, working with people in the community so they are comfortable contributing to Ruby. So to kind of wrap up here, because um, I think I'm definitely over time at this point, um, anybody can contribute to Ruby. Like It's not like an elitist club here. Uh, we want people to be involved. And uh, contributing to Ruby isn't just like doing like digging into the C source code and like contributing patches. Like just like filing bugs or like and getting involved in discussions there is just as important um, as writing the code. Like you need you should want to express your voice in this in the language that you're using uh, and be involved there. And I, I think only working together like as a whole we can kind of get Ruby into a point that solves everyone like the kind of issues that everyone's facing. Um, and uh, Finally, like I'm looking forward to getting more people involved. And uh, if you d have issues or other things that you want to talk to the core team about, I'm open to discussing those with you um, and looking forward to your contributions. So thank you. <laughs>